The U.S. has gone from a small collection of disunited colonies into one of the world's largest and strongest countries. America has had a very interesting history, and that's what we will be talking about today. Let's start with the Native Americans. I know there were other Homo sapien-like beings before that, and Pangaea before that. We have to start. But anyway, Native Americans arrived in North America through a landmass called Beringia. This land bridge only existed because of low sea levels thanks to the Ice Age. The reason why humans crossed it was because mammoths did. Mammoths were probably all you ate in ancient Siberia, and those mammoths liked to move for some reason. Keep in mind that this migration of humans took place over thousands of years in frigid weather. Eventually, humans arrived in what is now Alaska and began moving south toward warmer temperatures. The Ice Age ended, meaning that humans had really no way to leave the continent. Some tribes began to discover agriculture, but a lot of tribes were still hunter-gatherers until European colonization. There's plenty of more information about pre-colonization Native Americans that I, for some reason, can't be bothered to learn. But I'll probably make a video on it eventually. As it turns out, river valleys are a great place to start a civilization, and that held true in the Mississippi Valley. The Mississippi Valley, which of course is along the Mississippi River, was a great place to grow crops, and eventually the Mississippi River Civilization was created. It was the first major civilization in North America. The Mississippians really liked building mounds. Pretty much every city had one. Many towns are supposedly built on, an on ancient American burial grounds, but I'm not sure if they're all haunted. By the time of the first European settlements, there were a few major tribes. There was the Iroquois, or Haudenosaunee. They were a federation of four tribes that all decided to unite to avoid war. Another fact about them was that they invented lacrosse. There, there are also many Algonquin tribes. This culture had a surprisingly large range. They spread from eastern Canada all the way to modern-day Virginia. Despite having such a long range, all the Algonquins had very similar languages and cultures. They also built mostly similar houses. That's pretty impressive for people who, according to the Europeans, were primitive. Speaking of Europeans, it's colonization time. It's so much fun. It's really not fun. Now, many of you may be thinking, oh, I know, Columbus discovered America. He didn't. Thanks, American education system. He also didn't prove the world was round. Thanks, American education system. He also was not nice at all to the natives he encountered. Thanks, American education system. Columbus ne never landed anywhere in any U.S. state. The closest he came was Puerto Rico, but I really don't want to count that. It would be a member of his crew who would be much more important to America. At the age of 19, a certain Ponce de Leon would join Columbus's crew for the quest for a new world. Even though he, he was a minor crew member, he was instrumental in the establishment of the colony of La Isabella. After that, he set up a major settlement in Puerto Rico and would later become the governor of the whole island. While he was governor, some random person came up to him and basically said, So you like exploring, right? Yeah. Well, I heard that there is an island called Bimini. And if you find Bimini, you will find the Fountain of Youth. For some reason, Ponce de Leon believed him and set out for Bimini. He sailed north to the Bahamas and eventually reached what is now Florida. He set up a settlement that in the next few decades would grow and become St. Augustine. Ponce de Leon would continue to explore Florida, but would eventually be killed by a poisoned arrow. Explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano sailed up along the east coast, but never established any settlements. Jacques Cartier, a French explorer, also sailed along the east coast and also did not establish any settlements. Fernando de Soto and his group of explorers walked all the way from Florida to Arkansas, becoming the first Europeans to see the Mississippi River. Around the same time, California got its first settlers. Francisco de Coronado traveled from Spanish settlements in Mexico to modern-day Kansas. Now that's a long walk. He would also become the first European to see the Grand Canyon. Another thing he did was accidentally bring horses to the Plains natives. French settlers set up Fort Caroline in what is now Jacksonville, Florida. Now, Fort would eventually be besieged and taken by the Spanish. The English, after claiming Newfoundland, set up the colony of Roanoke. The colony was set up by Sir Walter Raleigh. The original settlement did not go so well, and Raleigh decided to abandon the other settlers and sail back to England. When he returned after a few years, he found no settlers and no buildings. The only thing, the only thing that he found was the name of a nearby tribe inscribed on a tree. This most likely meant that the settlers were attacked and destroyed by Native Americans. Because of this, Roanoke is known as the Lost Colony. A few decades later, the English set up the colony of Jamestown. Unlike Roanoke, Jamestown actually survived. 
The New England set up other colonies in and around Virginia. One of these would be Williamsburg. They set up a council of elected representatives that would be the start of democracy in America. In, in England, a radical group of Puritans known as the Separatists were exiled to the Netherlands. Despite Dutch hospitality, the Separatists did not want their descendants to be assimilated into Dutch culture, so they decided to buy a boat known as the Mayflower and sail to Jamestown. Due to a combination of strong currents and nobody on the ship knowing how to sail, they missed Jamestown and arrived in Massachusetts. They arrived in what would later be the Plymouth Colony. Soon after they arrived, they met a man named Squantum, or Squanto for short. Squanto had worked for English settlers in Jamestown and spoke perfect English. The first words he said to the pilgrims were, no joke, do you have any beer? Squanto, as well as the whole of the nearby tribe, were extremely helpful to the pilgrims, and Plymouth Colony would survive until today. Unfortunately, shortly after the famous first Thanksgiving, Squanto died of disease. This would be a small part of an event known as the Columbian Exchange. Over 90% of Americans died of disease, primarily smallpox. The English began to quickly spread out into what would become the 13 colonies. The Dutch colonized Governor's Island in New York Harbor, and after a few years would purchase Manhattan and set up the settlement of New Amsterdam, as well as setting up Fort Orange further along the Hudson River. The British would attack and take over New Amsterdam and Fort Orange. Fort Orange would be changed to Albany and New Amsterdam into New York. The Spanish began to establish small settlements in what is now the western U.S. The French began to move south from, from Quebec and claim the Ohio Valley and, and would later set up Louisiana Territory. Russia sailed across the Bering Strait and set up Russian America, later called Alaska. Many more settlements that we really don't have time for were set up across America. Many people left Europe for the Americas to find better lives or to bring glory for their country. By the mid-1700s, Britain began to build forts in French-claimed territory. France basically said, hey, this is our territory, can you kindly leave? Now, Britain refused and war was declared. This war would become a massive global conflict that we are going to ignore and instead say that Britain and their ally Spain won. Britain got French territories in Ohio Valley and Spain got Louisiana territory. The British victory was helped by a certain George Washington. After the war, there was a lot of violence between European settlers and Native Americans west of the Appalachians. As a response, King George III created the Royal Proclamation Line, which outlawed British settlement past the Appalachians. This angered many Americans. Many had fallen lost friends and loved ones in the hopes that they could settle in the newly acquired land, but all of those hopes were dashed. This would be the beginning of revolutionary sentiment in the 13 colonies. After the war, Britain was in extreme debt, so they decided to tax colonists. In the mind of the British government, Britain had fought a war for the colonies, and now they must be repaid. But the colonists felt that they were being taxed unfairly, primarily because they had no representation in, in the parliament that was taxing them. Britain created the Stamp Act. It required that all paper documents, even ones that were not purchased, had to have a stamp on it that people would have to pay for. Several protests erupted around the colonies against the Stamp Act. A protest began in Boston. Protesters threw stones at nearby Br British guards outside the Customs House. The guards panicked and gathered a group of soldiers. Protesters began to throw oyster shells at the soldiers. The soldiers fired back and killed several people. This event became well known after an engaging by Paul Revere was published. Britain got rid of the Stamp Act, but created another tax system that was just as strict, known as the Townshend Tax. They set several taxes and tariffs on several objects. One of these was tea. The Townshend Tax gave the British East India Company a monopoly on tea. The colonists did not like this. A group of revolutionaries known as the Sons of Liberty, dressed up as Native Americans, boarded a British ship in Boston Harbor and threw the tea into the sea. This event, known as the Boston Tea Party, would lead the British closing Boston Harbor, revoking the Massachusetts Colonial Charter, meaning that they could not govern themselves, and enforcing other strict rules. All other colonies rallied behind Massachusetts and created the First Continental Congress in 1774. Several militias began to, f to fight the British. Britain marched troops from Boston Harbor to the towns of Lexington and Concord to take a large store of weapons and ammunition. Militia met the British in Concord, and the, and the first battle of the American Revolution occurred. Shortly after the Battle of Bunker Hill happened, the battle actually took place on Breed's Hill, but I guess the leaders of both armies were too lazy to, you know, 
look at a map. The Americans lost the battle as a whole, but the British had twice the casualties. After Bunker Hill, the Continental Congress sent the Olive Branch petition to the British government in hopes that they could settle matters diplomatically. The British said no. After that, it was clear that peace was not an option. The Continental Army was created and put under the leadership of George Washington. On July 2, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed, but not fully ratified until July 4th. Yeah, that famous painting of all the delegates all together to sign the Declaration is not very accurate. The Continental Army managed to force the British Army out of Boston, but was not able to defend against the British attack on New York. Eventually, the British took over the American capital of Philadelphia. Washington's army was forced to retreat to Valley Forge, where they spent much of the winter. While at Valley Forge, the Continental Army was trained and organized. On Christmas Day, the Continental Army crossed the Delaware River and took over an important British fort, and would later take back control of Philadelphia. In the next few years, America would win multiple battles, ending with the Battle of Yorktown, which British forces were surrounded and surrendered. After multiple years of negotiations, the Treaty of Paris was signed. No, not that Treaty of Paris, or that Treaty of Paris, the 1783 Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris said that Britain must recognize America as an independent nation and force British troops to leave the colonies. A new nation had been formed that would do many things, good and bad, in the next few centuries. All that and more in part two.